everyone. I, uh, I don't know if there will be people who are late, but that normally happens. And I can just, I think every person who comes late, I will call forward and let them ask a que answer a question. Can we do that? In any case, so my name is Johan Stein. I'm from Johannesburg in South Africa. Thank you for the invite. I also spoke at SQA Days in Moscow now in November. It was a lovely conference to be at. Um, it's also an honor to be here today. Um, have you all been here for the two days? Any of you only came to the conference today? Okay, so your brains are totally fried by now. <laughs> it's so much information, isn't it? Not yet. We'll see. Um, I think in Moscow I spoke on the second day, the very last session. It's a, it's a challenge then, because you know, even though you might be interested in the topic, um, your, your brain <laughs> is maybe not used to it. I, I just know I can never go back to school or to university ever again. Because you sit there every day and you listen to lectures. Maybe when we were 20 it was, it was easier, but now you know, you're working and all that. Um, so for me when I attend a conference, you know when with work you go for a breakaway of two days, I find it incredibly difficult to concentrate. So I might do one or two surprising things to get you to wake up. Um, one day at a conference, um, I actually asked, I'm not going to ask you, but I asked, but it was only two sections like this. When I started, I asked everyone on this side to move to that side, people on this side to that side. A lot of people were unhappy because people like to sit where they sit. You know, when, uh, like if it's a classroom or a boardroom environment, I don't know if you've seen, people always sit on the exact same place. So if you want to upset people, go and sit on their seat, even though it's not really their seat, but they think this is where I always sit, you know. So it kind of woke them up a little bit. In any case, so I'm going to be speaking about the DevOps tsunami. And it's based on an article I wrote on LinkedIn three, I think, years ago, two or three years ago, which caused a bit of a stir. But I'll get to that um, just now. Um, let me just quickly ask you, um, how many of you work in a DevOps squad or a DevOps kind of an environment? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, and if I ask you, maybe I should do that to the latecomers, what is DevOps? It's always interesting what people will say. Because you know, there is actually not an officially recognized definition for DevOps. Where's our DevOps expert? He told me before the talk he's a DevOps expert. I don't have the mic with me now. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. What would you say is DevOps? So, so who was on the DevOps game yesterday? Can someone help me out with the definition? Thank you. What we learned from this? So anyone would help, what is DevOps? We're putting them on the so, spot. But okay. now you've just diverted the question it's to someone else. Yes, of course. That's I'm very delegating. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it could be. <laughs> so first of all, I would say it's culture. It's culture of uh, great, collaboration. I'm just joking. I'm joking with you. <laughs> Are you offended now? Don't be. No, no, I just, I just Do you like really to want to come to my conference? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. I hope he invites me to his, um, his Hastev, is it? Let's advertise it. It is in November? October? Okay. So in Hungary, I think? Okay, super. <laughs> Here's the advertising for you. <laughs> All right. Um, what I have found is um, a lot of people who work in DevOps, especially quality engineers or testers like us, have very different experiences of what DevOps is. You may have found this as well. I find that DevOps, like it happened with Agile and test automation years back, it's often pushed from the top down. So the, the, the C-suite or the, the top bosses, they all go away. Um, or I worked for a company where IBM was a very big vendor and they would take our CIO and um, chief operating officer, some of the, the top tier leaders, to um, Silicon Valley, to Facebook to Netflix and to those kind of companies. I worked previously for a very big bank. And then they all come back very excited and then they try exactly to duplicate what Netflix is doing in this very big corporate that's still very siloed, um, still a lot of old kind of practices, a lot of politics. And then they push this concept of DevOps down on us. Have you experienced that as well? I think with any kind of change that often happens. I know a guy, he said his boss in December's for the holidays, he always reads some sort of a book, and they always dread him coming back in January, because he will all, he'll take what is in that book, and he will just try and 
apply it to everyone. Now, I'm all for books. I'm also going to show you some books that I want to, I would like to recommend you read. But um, for us who work in the trenches, so to speak, kind of on ground level in the projects, living in this DevOps world is often very difficult. Um, I always tell people DevOps is, and, and maybe to your answer as well, it's a lot of people approach DevOps as a primary technical conversation or a tools conversation. And you start hearing all these GitHubs, this thing, that thing, all these fruit and vegetable kind of tools, you know, um, cucumbers and those kind of things. But it's fundamentally a massive shift in how we work as an organization. And I think, well, my personal experience is that push from the top down was a tools and a technical push without giving any thought of how it's going to change our culture and how we work together. And you know, as human beings, we've been around, depending on how you view science, but for thousands of years. And I think the fundamentals of how we worked and operated thousands of years ago is still true. We are still fundamentally selfish beings. Self-preservation is still the thing that drives us. Now, hopefully we are a bit more evolved than we were 10,000 years ago. But I sometimes think if I look at a typical corporate environment, we just dress nicer. and We speak better and nicer to each other. But the fundamentals of the caveman is still there. That need to survive, that need for me to be better than you. Because what if they promote you and not me? So I'll be your best friend. I will smoke with you every afternoon. We will know each other's children's names. But if it's between you getting the promotion and me, I'm going to make sure I get it. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it keeps us competitive. But I, why I'm saying that, because I think in the likes of DevOps, where you now suddenly the whole way you're working is different to some extent than what you've been used to. I have seen the ugliness of people come out when it comes to the likes of DevOps, or for that matter, any kind of change. A lot of people don't like change. Um, I work for a bank where, like with these big corporates, these people have been there for 15, 20, 30 years. A lot of the people at the top management layer are 55 or so, so they're very close to retirement. So you can imagine their appetite for change is not really there. You know, I've also found that if you, from the bottom up, if you want to bring in change, if you come up with great ideas, it's often shot down or just ignored. I'm sure some of you can identify with that. And a lot of companies talk the talk. They will say we're a learning organization. There's even an email address for great ideas. Uh, or, you know, no idea is stupid. Come and tell us. But the reality is that never happens. So what I want to talk about today when I talk about DevOps, and I've got an hour and a half, and it's... Well, I have to really wing it, <laughs> not really. No, we'll see if we finish early, we do. This is not going to be a technical conversation. I think a lot of DevOps conversations is primarily technical, and that's important because I do think the kind of tools and technology we are exposed to as quality engineers is very different than we might have been exposed to five years, four years ago or so. I want to talk about the culture change and the human element of DevOps. And I also would like to give you a bit of a background of where DevOps comes from, because it's actually not new. The principles of DevOps have been around for a, l for a long time, from engineering to manufacturing, um, and then the development of lean and those kind of things. So I'll talk through some of that. All right, so let me quickly get to my slides. That was the first one. It says, hello, beautiful people. <laughs> there are some beautiful people there. I wanted to just f say firstly, thank you for being here today. Thank you for coming to this event. How many of you are not from Latvia? A lot of people. A lot of people have traveled. Who have traveled 24 hours like I did? <laughs> 12 hours? Who's from very far away? Outside of Europe, for instance. Well, India? Anyone else from outside of Europe? Okay, but I mean, you can be in Europe and still be very far away, isn't it true? So that's it, just to say thank you for being here. Um, well, that was my slide for, to ask you where you're from. I actually wanted to show you the next one. I'm sure many of you know where South Africa is. South Africa is often in the news for very bad reasons, like it is at the moment. Problems with our power, power generating facilities. So we have a lot of so-called blackouts or rolling blackouts at the moment. Um, and it's just because of neglect over many, many years of our power stations. And also, interestingly enough, our previous president, who was a very corrupt person and who kind of got ousted and hopefully will be prosecuted, was big friends with Vladimir Putin. 
and they were about to sign a multi-billion dollar um, a nuclear power generation deal, which was then shut down because the country couldn't affect it, or afford it rather. So now one wonders if you're into conspiracy theories, I wonder if a lot of the black cuts at the moment is not um, executed by a foreign agent, for instance, to prove that we actually need the multi-billion dollar power. But I'm not going to go into conspiracy theories or election hacking or anything like that. But yes, you all know where South Africa is. Whenever I say I'm from here, people will say, oh, Nelson Mandela and apartheid, we know South Africa. All people will say, but you're white. I say, yes, I am an African and I live in Africa. <laughs> but, you know, um, and the reason for that is people outside of Africa, the only media you expose, ex expose to is often of a hut somewhere with two people with a spear mixing beer. You know? I lived in the UK for a few years and I remember one day um, there was a report about South Africa. And on the image in the background was a guy running from another guy with a spear. So he was chasing him. And in the background was a mountain and grass. And the, it said at the bottom, Johannesburg. Okay? And I'll show you a picture of Johannesburg just now. And I thought, but this is what people see. So no wonder they think we all live nuts and we ride on elephants. Uh, have any of you been to South Africa before? A lot of people are. It's Obviously, it's not a first world country. There's one there. But you definitely don't land on a dirt road, and there's no elephant that will pick you up. It's not out of Africa or gorillas in the mist, you know, those kind of movies. So, um, and then uh, just since I'm here and I'm an ambassador for my country, I wanted to show you a few pictures quickly. <laughs> so this is, in fact, Johannesburg. It's the largest man-made forest in the world, believe it or not. Almost all the trees have been planted over the last, I don't know, 50 or 100 years. So there are places where you drive on the highway and you just see trees amongst all the buildings and houses. I often think, and the, and the air is bad, like in a lot of cities, the quality of air, but imagine there were no trees. It would have been unbearable. Obviously, Cape Town, the most beautiful city in the world by far, and an elephant that will pick you up from the airport. Okay, so, so just a little bit of marketing, but if you ever can visit South Africa, um, despite all the bad press, please do. Um, like in any country or city, there are places not to go to, and then there are great places for um, tourists. Many of my friends who live in Cape Town are actually Europeans who went to visit South Africa and said they want to come back and they move their So um, we also have an annual testing conference that's hosted in Johannesburg and in Cape Town. So if you, um, and some of the people who are speaking here like Joel and um, some of the others often come to that event. That's actually where I met them. Okay, so enough of that. Last little bit of marketing, just a little bit about me, and then we're going to get into the topic. On this side is just a screenshot of my website. There is my URL, thebusinessoftesting.com. Go and have a look through the website. You can obviously follow me if you want to on LinkedIn or um, Twitter. Uh, this is the talk I did last year. It's not the one in Russia. It's the one I did in South Africa on AI and testing and some of my books. Um, so for what it's worth, you can go and visit that URL. And then just a little bit about my experience. I um, was a director at SQS. Um, I'm sure many of you will know SQS, largest peer play testing firm in the world. How many of you have worked for SQS before, maybe? No one? They've recently changed their name. They got acquired and, and rebranded. I just can't remember that name. Then I was at Accenture for a while, where I was the capability head in South Africa for software quality engineering and testing. <clears throat> it was interesting to work for a big consulting firm. The one thing I learned, and it's not about Accenture. It could have been IBM or PwC or anyone else. I'm not somebody for big consulting firms. So sometimes you have to work somewhere to know it's not for you. <laughs> that happened with me. And then up until recently, I actually worked for one of my largest clients, NetBank, one of the four first-tier banks in South Africa, about 48,000 people. Um, and my job, which was very interesting, is amongst other things, I looked after the vendor relationship with the testing vendors. It's about 17 vendors who provide testing services or time and material capacity services to the bank. Most of them I have competed with over the years when I was at Accenture and uh, SQS. So it was interesting to actually be the client now of these companies that I've always competed with. And as a little side note, um, I will never sell testing services the same way again after seeing how everyone else does it. Some of you may have been exposed to, to vendors coming to pitch business for you, um, especially the big consulting firms. They always do the same. They all pitch it the same way, especially that first meeting. The first one or two slides are about how great and how big they are. So we're a 400,000 um, person company. We're a $40 billion company. We're based in 58 countries and stuff like that. 
And as the client, you sit on the other side of the desk, and the only thing that comes up in your head is, so what? Okay. What can you do for me? You know, so if you, if you are client-facing, it's sometimes difficult to put yourself in the shoes of your client. It's, I think people buy primarily on relationship. Of course, people buy on capability and price. But when you sell a service, like a QA service, people uh, want to trust you. You know, if I was selling a Dell server as opposed to an HP server, it's about spec and pricing, mo most likely. When you sell QA, or dev for that matter, or anything else, you're selling trust. It's that you can give me some of your problems, and you can trust me that we will solve it based on the SLAs and the contract stuff like that. So if people don't like you, and they don't trust you, they will most likely not buy from you. And you don't have to be a salesperson or an account manager to be in sales. If you work for a vendor, and you work in a project, you are the representative of that vendor to that client. But you're also the client's representative back to the vendor, because they can come up with all kinds of smart ideas about the business they want to pitch to the client. But you work in the trenches, so it's important to give that feedback back to them. Whether they'll listen is sometimes the question. You know? But we all are in sales. Our whole life is about selling. Everything we do, we try and convince a friend to go for a beer. It's actually selling, if you think about it. Try and make peace with your partner. A huge selling process. All right. So that's just basically my background. And then a month ago, I started with this firm, IQ Business. It's an 800 um, people sized company based in South Africa, management consulting. Um, they do a lot of um, agile and DevOps kind of coaching and development, uh, change management and the like, but they don't have a formal QA client offering. So that's my job, is to build an offering to their client base for quality engineering and, and testing. Okay, that's now enough about me. I'm sure you didn't come to listen to these slides primarily. Oh, look, there's one more, sorry. <laughs> Just the upcoming talks. Obviously, I've got the, the St. Petersburg talk coming up. I don't know how many of you will be able to make that, but I'm really looking forward to that. I'm going to speak about what I call the business of software testing. Um, as you go through your career, um, you either become more of a specialist, automation engineer, or something like that, or you grow in management. And what I have found is a lot of people who really like doing testing, or for that matter, BAs or developers or whatever, as you grow in your career, you end up actually just managing people. And 80 or 90% of your job is sorting out their crap. I don't know how many of you have experienced that. So you no longer just do the thing that you like doing. Now it's about budgeting and dealing with vendors and recruiting people and managing people and career paths, capacity management, supply and demand, all those kind of things. That's what my talk's going to be about, is to just help and equip people a little bit with running the business side of testing, as opposed to being the technical kind of experts. All right. Um, and then next week, Wednesday, I'm speaking in Johannesburg about HR and artificial intelligence, which is one of my pet subjects. Obviously, the way we recruit people, the way we screen people, the way we, we run our HR processes, the way we do performance management is impacted greatly by artificial intelligence. I heard the other day of a case where people do the initial interview is over Skype, but they've got AI in the background. Obviously, the candidate knows about it. They give consent. The AI reads their facial expressions and can detect deception, nervousness, and things like that. So obviously, it's going to impact everything we do in HR. And then this is another AI conference I'm doing also in South Africa in April. And I've got a few more coming up. OK, now it's really the end of me. <laughs> Do you want to take a break yet? <laughs> All right. Everyone's still here? Okay, so the next slide is about a cocktail party. So, you know, when you go to a party, um, what's the first thing people ask you? So, what do you do? Okay. I just want to see if this mic's on because I'm going to ask some questions. <laughs> you go to any social event. You ask people, or they ask you, so, so what do you do? And it's always interesting when you ask testers that question. Because I sometimes find it difficult to explain it, especially if it's not a technical person, or I'm not sure if they're technical. You know? So I'm going to ask somebody. I'm going to put you on the spot. i ask you. Hello. <laughs> so what do you do? Uh, hello, I'm junior testing. Junior testing. OK. And what do you test? Uh, I test program. Program, OK. You wanted to sit in front. <laughs> so what do you do for a living? I'm Hatoya, Automation Quality Engineer. Okay. So if I knew nothing and I said, what does that mean? It's not easy to explain it, is it? Yeah, in this case, I answer that I am a programmer. Okay. 
Let me pick on a guy. <laughs> so what do you do for a living? Um, testing, test automation, and first-line support. So as a buzzword I heard here, software quality advocate in an agile team. Okay. So if I'm not from testing, I would have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Most likely. And if I say, okay, but you're testing stuff, is it... Because um, if, if you're not a software tester, first time I heard about testing, I thought it was like crash test dummies. You know, these dummies they put and they crash them against the wall and they take this slow motion footage to see how the, the seatbelt works and stuff like that. So if I say so you're testing stuff, what, what is it that you test? It's an in-house software for a company. So yeah, we have to go technical to explain. Okay, yeah. So have you had that problem before when people ask you what you do? Are they not technical or you're not sure? Is your hand up? Yeah. Let me ask you. Well, let me bring the mic quickly. Ask the question. Okay, so what do you do for a living? Uh, I breed. You breed? <laughs> or breathe? I breed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Smarty pants. <laughs> well, you do. Hopefully, you breathe for a living. Okay. So it's not an easy question. What, what do we do? We, we test. We make sure stuff works. That's, I sometimes use that. I often use a, an example of an app. You know, if you use Uber or something like that, you want to make sure it works fast. Uh, it's obviously performance testing. You want to make sure your data is safe. It's, security testing, those kind of things. But it's not an easy question to answer. So um, that's my next slide, is when people ask us what we do, we say we're testers or we're testing. And then when they say, what are you testing? Essentially, the summary of what we answer is we're testing functionality. You might not use that word, but we make sure the stuff works. All right, that's, as I said, it's not easy to explain. Why do I talk about a tsunami? So this talk is called the DevOps tsunami. I'm going to get into the whole tsunami concept just now, but many of you know, I hope, that the world of quality engineering and testing is changing very rapidly and has changed a lot already. Some of us work for organizations where that change is slow, so even though you might be upskilling yourself and you might be ready to do work in a DevOps squad and your technical abilities have, uh, you have increased that, but the kind of projects they put you on or the way they work might not allow you to actually practically change. So that's true for a lot of people. And the problem with that is we work in organizations and, and where the, the sand is really shifting from under us, the world is changing rapidly, especially with the advent of the like of artificial intelligence, robotics and the like. And we might very soon, if not already for some of us, be irrelevant. Perhaps the only reason why some of us still have a job is because the organization we work for is very immature. But it's difficult to go find another job in a more technically advanced kind of a faster moving organization. So the, the thing about a tsunami, I'm sure all of you know what a tsunami is. It's, you know, when there's an earthquake somewhere in the ocean and that big wave hits you. There's no warning. They do have some apparently early warning systems in the ocean. I don't know. I don't know if I trust those things. But if you wake up one day and your nose is on the ceiling, it's because your whole mattress is drifting <laughs> and you're touching the ceiling, you know? It's, a it's actually a sad joke because tsunamis obviously kill hundreds and thousands of people. The, the point is, technological change is so quick. For some of us, it could be that it's too late already. It's too late to upskill yourself. We should have done it a long time ago. So the purpose of my talk today is not to scare anyone or to discourage anyone. But hopefully you'll walk out of here today when it comes to the topic of DevOps and then as it relates to new technologies like AI, is to realize that you, even if the organization you work with or work for is not allowing it, you know, with the likes of LinkedIn Learning and Udemy and uh, many other services, there really is no excuse not to upskill yourself. There's so many people that you meet at this conference who will help you, that will connect with you and, and work with you. But I think a problem for all of us, or many of us, is Netflix and laziness. <laughs> it's obviously easier to watch a nice movie at the end of a hard day with a glass of wine than to actually sit and study. But there's no more excuses. Even if you say, I have no money, or the company is not willing to pay for it, or you might be a single parent. I'm a single parent. So time is, is not easy to find. But you have to find the time. And you have to upskill yourself, depending on what it is that you want to become eventually. So for some of us, that's a difficult question. I'd, some of us might say, I don't actually know if I want to be in testing. It's kind of the only job I found. 
Or you might say, I love testing and I want to do this automation thing, but it seems very tough and I don't really have a development background and I actually feel a bit stupid to try and do it. So I think a lot of people self-doubt and, and struggle with their own confidence. Twelve years ago when I started working, I not only did not know no anything about testing, I knew almost nothing about software development or the software development life cycle. I was in IT for most of my life, but more on the hardware side of things, networking and things like that. And then I moved to the UK for four years where I worked in the mobile phone industry. Twelve years ago, I moved back to South Africa. My first job was at a local testing provider. And uh, I felt so stupid in meetings because they use these acronyms, you know. Uh, you must actually do, you know what an acronym is? It's like, a, like SDLC is an acronym, for instance. People throw those acronyms around, especially when you started a new company. I just did a month ago. And people have been using, it for, using those terms for months or years. But sometimes you have to stop them and say, what does that thing mean? And it's always surprising to me that people, they know what it is, but what does the acronym actually mean? People don't know. You know? So what I sometimes do in meetings for fun is I just make up a few acronyms. And no one ever asks me what it is, because people feel they're going to be stupid, or they're going to think you think they are stupid. So I just say, you know, we tested the WC32 application the other day, uh, and it worked fine. No one asks me what it is because it's a bullshit term. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, you know. In any case, so back to our cocktail party and back to how the world is changing. This is what the answer should be. What do you do for a living? Quality engineering. Software quality engineering. Now, maybe that's not true, but it should be what you're doing. If, if you're just a tester, especially if you're just a tester at the end of the cycle, then you have to really upskill yourself because the world is moving from under your feet. Um, somebody said to me the other day, they're, they're agile. And when you, I'm sure you've all experienced this. Like with DevOps, if you ask people what's agile, you'll get 40 different definitions. The f famous one is we don't have to do documentation anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, but they say agile for them is two things. Firstly, they've introduced agility. So the way they work has changed. But from a pure agile point of view, they're definitely not doing that. Almost every company I've ever worked with, every client I've ever worked with, none of them were truly agile. Okay? Or they still do waterfall. Now, I know agile is iterative, but they do like mini waterfalls. So the testers are still isolated and right at the end when there's no more time and budget. But now rather than after 55 weeks of development, now it's after two weeks sprints. But the fundamentals of how they work together as a multifunctional squad is not working. All right, and I do see some smiles. So we're quality engineers, and we no longer test functionality. We ultimately test customer experience. And that's one of the key things when we talk about the likes of Agile and DevOps. Theoretically, everyone in that DevOps squad should be quality engineers, or quality should be a priority for everyone, even though you might be the only tester in that squad. Quality starts at the beginning. We all know these kind of terms. But quality, true quality, end-to-end -end quality, and how the client experiences that application is ultimately the goal of what we do. So just keep this slide in mind, perhaps when you answer the cocktail party question the next time. All right, and quality engineering is a point that's very relevant to the DevOps conversation today. Oh, I do have one of these. I'm just walking around the whole time. Let's go. All right, so manufacturing and engineering. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these principles today. And I'm going to also, at the end of my presentation, show you a few books that I recommend you read. Some of them are books you most likely have read already. But DevOps started, or the principles of DevOps, started in manufacturing and engineering many, many years ago. So it's actually not new. To apply those principles in software, in the software development practice, is fairly new. I would say about 10 years old or so. I think DevOps was first coined in, in 2009. Um, but when we talk about DevOps and when we talk about new ways of work, I always try and remember this picture, a factory. Now, obviously, this one's got a lot of robots and it's quite automated, but in some factories we still have people on an assembly line doing their little thing. Um, but what does an engineer do when he or she looks at a factory like this? They look at wastage. They look at, so for instance, you might have to walk to a printer every five minutes to get a document. Questions like, is that printer close to you? Why do you have to print the document? So it's just essentially about how do we actually work? How do we avoid wastage in the form of material, but also in the form of often one of the biggest problems? Because you wait for things to happen that you can't control, 
And then when it happens, you have to work 200 hour weeks or whatever to finally get it done. I'm sure performance testers, performance engineers, if any of you are performance people, they experience that, they will sit around doing nothing for a few days and then suddenly it, it happens and they work crazy stupid hours. But waiting is wastage, it's time wastage. So I want to encourage you to, some of the things I'm going to mention today, but um, as a the concept of engineering, the concept of a factory floor where the lean principles came from, go and read a, little, a bit more about that because it is extremely applicable to our craft and our trade of what we're doing. All right. When I design a, a slide deck, I always start with the very last slide first. And the reason is, you will not remember everything I said today. You will not remember everything you, you learned at this conference. Because as I said, your brains are most likely already tired. Um, and what we often do when we speak, and I'm sure we've all seen this with ourselves, is you try and pump in as much information as you can um, and maybe because you have a, a lot to say, but also you might think, what will the people think if I don't give them like a lot of information? But our ability to remember things is actually not as amazing as we think. What do we remember? If you think about it for thousands of years, how have we been taught? How have we been learning? Through storytelling? Do you sit around a fire at night, a thousand years ago in Africa or wherever, and your elders or people tell stories? So storytelling is how we learn, not facts. I mean, I could have 55 lines of, of items on every slide. You won't learn. Storytelling. And the other one is pictures. We remember pictures. We might not remember facts and lines of words and stuff like that. All right, so the last slide is this one. Um, we have a break in the schedule in about five or so minutes. It's already 40 minutes. Yeah, 45. Okay, so I'm essentially halfway through my talk, but this is slide, what, five? Okay, so the question before I get to this, do any of you want a break, or shall we just keep on going? Okay, keep on going, all right. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. It's from Tricentis on one of their reports, um, and it talks about the evolution of software testing and quality management. This is my last slide, so you'll see it again, okay. What is the one thing I want you to leave with? Because you're not going to leave with a lot. You're not going to leave with, even you might take notes, which is great. The slides will obviously be available in the next few weeks for download, especially when I, toward the end of the deck, show you the books that I recommend you read. There might be books that you don't know about. But you walk out of a presentation typically with one or two kind of main ideas or impressions. All right. So that's always what I start with. What's the one thing I would like you guys to leave with? And it's encapsulated in this picture here. And basically, and I'll go through it now in a bit more detail. The world of testing is changing rapidly. The world of technology is changing rapidly. It's in your hands to upskill yourself. There's nothing to be feared, but you have to get off your butt and start studying and join groups and start talking and things like that. And DevOps, even though it's a term we've been using for 10 years, it's most likely a term we're all throwing around a lot has and is fundamentally changing the way we're working. So if that's the only impression you're leaving with, and if that's going to hopefully kind of encourage you to get going with upskilling and studying, then I'm happy. Then I think I've done what the slide should have done. So just very briefly, what this shows is it's almost like an evolution. You know, the, the pictures you see of evolution, it's a monkey, and then it starts walking straight up, and eventually then there's a, a human being at the end. Um, although I think it's not a true reflection Knowing most people, I know, I think they're still pretty much here. Hello, Carolina, how are you? <laughs> Good, I was looking for you. Anyway, so just briefly, we all know this manual testing, which took weeks and months. Um, then Agile, or just introducing agility, as I said earlier. Then there's this, what they call this DevOps chasm, which we're going to talk about today. Then we start looking at continuous testing and continuous integration and deployment and things like that. And then eventually we get to using artificial intelligence and things like that. In my experience, almost every company I've ever worked for, every client I've ever worked with, are still today here. Or they might be starting here. If you are working for an organization that's here, you are blessed because you are experiencing and learning things that's amazing. Are any of you, would you say you're working for a, like in a continuous delivery kind of pipeline, continuous testing? Any of you? A few hands, which is great. But I've also found in some organizations there are pockets in the organization that might be getting this right. But it's not necessarily the whole organization. 
All right. So what I wanted to tell you, if you either your skill set still sits here, or your skill sets might be better, but you're still working for an organization that's there, and change is not coming, find something else. Because the world's going to move past you without you maybe even knowing it. So that's my last slide. How long were you here? Have you been here for? You sneak in, and um, the Portuguese man there next to you. Okay, no pressure. All right, so what I want to do now, so just to give you the newcomers, the little latecomers, a bit of uh, context. I want to fundamentally talk about where DevOps comes from, because it's the principles behind DevOps is not new. And that's what this slide is saying. It's standing on the shoulders of giants. So I'm going to give you some names of people, and uh, later on some books, and I would encourage you to go and read the works of these people, because what we know today as DevOps or Agile in software delivery is built on these shoulders of giants, people who've been practicing these principles in manufacturing and in the industry for many, many years. We started the conversation today, what is DevOps? This is typically the picture you see when people try and explain it. They might say something like, it's essentially it is Dev and Ops just working together nicely. I've heard that explanation a few times, you know. Or people will bring in the whole shift left conversation. Or um, it's just, if you, I'd love to ask all of you, I don't think we have time, but it's interesting if you ask people, what is it? So for me, on a very high level and in a simple way, if somebody asked me, I would say, this side of the team wants to bring in change and start new things and break things and it's all exciting and they have to move fast because the market is moving. These guys are the gatekeepers. They want to make sure it's working and it's always working and it's always on. And they don't like a lot of change. They don't like any instability. So typically, they were fighting with them and they were fighting with them too. So now we're trying to get them all to play in one team. I know it's you all smart people, so that's a super over. That's how I would tell it to my five-year-old son, if he asks me what is DevOps. But I think it kind of encapsulates it a little bit. Exciting change, I want to make sure the lights stay on. And the break things, don't make too many changes. So how do we now work together? So this is typically the picture you see. This is from Dan Ashby. If you don't know him, follow him on, on social media, read his things. This is essentially his view of DevOps, many of you might have seen this picture or the principles behind it. I think it's pretty straightforward. So, but then he, in this article that I cite here, he brings in this picture, and I love it, especially as a testing person. Where do we test in a DevOps world? Everywhere. Okay? Now, the practical reality of most of us working in DevOps is that this doesn't necessarily happen. But theoretically, that's the role of testing in a DevOps value chain. Whether your team or your organization allows it is always a good question. So then the question you ask yourself, and I ask myself, is am I able to play a quality engineering role in every one of these phases? Can I lead a team? Can I build a team? Can I recruit people? Do I know what kind of tools and technology to use to practice quality engineering and testing? right through the DevOps um, value chain. I like that picture. It's very um, subjective to testers. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> developers will have their name in there or, or BAs or, so, or anyone else. Um, but yes, quality happens straight through this process. And again, the question is, are we skilled up to do it? Briefly, the, the that article, I mentioned it in the beginning, a few years back, I wrote that article on LinkedIn, which is the title of my talk. And it was really a bit of a stab in the dark, because I mean, what the heck do I know in any case? But I just wrote about how the world of testing is changing, and for manual testers and things like that. I think it's the first article I ever did on LinkedIn. And I had a massive amount of negative responses. Negative emails and LinkedIn messages come back. And I corresponded with every one of those people. I was surprised, because I thought everyone was going, yoo -hoo, our world is changing, we're upskilling, um, we're going to be automation technical testers, all of us. And what I found through that little article and exercise is that most of the testers that I know or have worked with or responded were very negative towards the changes that's happening, the upskilling that's needed. In fact, not only negative, but many of them actually denied that it's happening. And it, it could be because the organization where you work in, you don't see these kind of changes. But that's really where this talk came from. And this really catapulted me to learn a lot more because while so many, either I'm wrong, which is more often than the case than not, or there's a lot of resistance in the global testing community. I've got about 22,000 testers on my LinkedIn feed from across the world, and I often interact with a lot of them. 
But the greater amount of people that I interact with when I publish that were negative about the changes. The other comment, which was interesting, they said DevOps is just a phase, like all the other things we've seen before. It's going to come and it's going to go. So don't get all excited about it. Before we know it, life will be the same. And I think the reality is, for many of us, that happened. You had this big DevOps thing in your organization, change management plan. Like I said, your bosses came from Silicon Valley where they saw it operating. But a year later, after all the hoo-ha, you're most likely just working the way you've been working always. I'm sure that's true for many of us. And it's maybe not your fault. All right. That's a tsunami, if you don't know. <laughs> There's been many movies about it, but this is obviously the one in Japan a few years back. If you can remember, this is the one that also affected the nuclear power stations. And there was radiation leakage, so that was obviously a massive problem. So that was 2011. It can happen any time. It's a scary picture. I don't want you to be scared, obviously, about DevOps, but the change of DevOps and new technologies in our world will be something similar to this. So here's a picture of Japan a few, a few years before that. And if you can remember why it looked like that. It could be Nagasaki, it could be Hiroshima, it could be some other places. But America dropped the atom bomb. Remember that. Most of Japan was destroyed. Most of the industrial capabilities, most of the cities, even if it wasn't by nuclear or, or atomic bomb attack through aerial bombing and the like. And after the war, obviously, they made peace and um, they made a few treaties with Japan. I think, if I'm not mistaken, things like you can't raise the army again and, and I don't remember all the rules. But America then partnered with Japan to rebuild the country. So imagine that's your job. Imagine they make you the head project manager of project rebuilding Japan. I mean, where do you even start? Okay. Now I'm going to mention a name that I hope many of you know. and His name is Deming. Who knows Deming? So if you studied computer science or engineering, you most likely know a bit about Deming. So Deming was asked by the American army to work with the Japanese in rebuilding the economy, building their country. He fell in love with their culture, the way they worked. Most people in America never knew about Deming until many years later, closer to his death. I think his last book was actually written in 93, which was the year of his death. But he, he really re revolutionized the way that organizations work and that the way that um, works in manufacturing. He really was the father of DevOps more than anyone else, even though it was a long time before they called it DevOps. There's some interesting talks on the internet that they call Deming to DevOps or books. But if you look through all the names, and that's why I spoke about standing on the shoulder of giants. Thank you. You can join us. Just as long as you keep your mouth shut and sit still. I'm just joking, although I'm not with him, but in any case. So that's Deming. And I really want to encourage you, and you might again, I mean, this guy has been in university 55 years ago. I know you've only recently graduated, not <laughs> because you're so young. So, um, okay, no, I'm not joking. I'm going to get myself into trouble, yeah. But people will, especially if you've been in IT, people will know Deming or he have heard about him. But what is his life really about? And it's difficult in this talk, and because I want to get through quite a few other names, um, to talk about Deming in detail. Oh, my word. A few things. He's seen as the father of the quality movement. He greatly impacted Japanese manufacturing. Think of this. There was nothing left in Japan after the war. And within a few short years, they became a top manufacturing um, country. And a lot of it is based on what Deming taught them. His teachings leaned, learned, oh sorry, went, um, resulted into the concepts of Lean and Six Sigma and others like that. The principles of DevOps is to a great extent built on what Deming taught. And um, this last sentence, if you follow my ideas, within five years you will be a world economic power. He's very famous for this. He had some Japanese industrial leaders in a room. With, uh, it's still in the time when there was nothing left. And that came true through Following his principles, Japan became an economic power already within five years. And as I said, no one in the U.S. at the time knew about Deming. It's, but, and they thought, why is Japan growing so quickly? Why are they becoming the top car manufacturer in the world? And, and they, they're like number one in so many industries. It's because there was this American guy that no one in America knew about, about called Deming. He's also famous for his 14 points. I'm going to briefly just go through them. Now, as I talk about Deming and the people that's coming after, think about DevOps. And remember, it's not new. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. 
and read as many DevOps books as you can, and you should, but read what these guys wrote about, because it'll help you see the principles of what we should do. Create the constancy of purpose. How many of you, if I ask you, what is the purpose of your job? It's a difficult question. If you ask me, I would say, so I can make money and look after my family, okay? Or um, I want to feel that I'm contributing something to society. But many of us work in projects and in programs that's so crazy, and there's so many politics, and it's, you, you barely get home alive most nights, that it's difficult to have this luxury of saying, I have a purpose. What is the purpose behind the project or the, the application that you're working on? It's a difficult question to answer. Sometimes the, the true, only true answer is, I'm doing it so the company can make money. But there must be more to it than just that. Right? All right. But it also talks about the purpose are toward the end user, because we are creating applications for somebody to use. Have you ever thought about that? Do you actually know some of these end users? Are you an end user of your company's products where possible? You know? So if they make space engineering equipment, you might not be an end user. But you, you might be a banking client of the bank you work for. You might be using the banking app. Um, I, I love to say this. People in meetings often throw their weight around by speaking about the customer. The customers want that. They don't want this. They want green screens and not blue screens or whatever. And then you ask them, so have you actually met these customers? And they might lie, but a lot of us don't actually know anyone at the end who's really using the, the product. You know, we should be speaking to them. We, we should, if it's like a pensioner or a very young person or a disabled person, you know, it's, uh, how are they experiencing what we're doing? Or are we just testing this little bit of functionality and our job is done? Constancy of purpose. I like this. Remember, this is now written 40 or so years ago. Replace a top-down command and control structure. Cooperative leadership models. After all these years after Deming, that I know of very few organizations where this is a reality. It's still top down. Well, I said earlier for the latecomers, <laughs> problem I have with DevOps, like with other things, it's pushed from the top down with no idea of what's happening on the ground now. It's going to impact people. But if you're a, a test manager or a leader of a team, think of how you are managing your people. Is it like this? It's sometimes tough depending on the environment organization you're working for. Sometimes you just want to tell your people, your, your team, what you sometimes tell your children. Just do it because I say so. Because <laughs> you don't always have time to answer questions or for any supposed negativity. But try and practice that principle. Seize dependencies on inspection to achieve quality. Think of a factory floor. If every five minutes you have to stop the factory floor so people in white jackets can come and make sure everything is working, you're not going to really produce anything. So constant... Um, Inspection, that could also be micromanagement, looking over people's shoulders. Look at this. Remember, guys, 40 years ago, build quality in from the start. Isn't this something that we're talking about a lot today? Isn't this shift left and stuff like that? So the things we're doing is not new. In the practice of awarding business on the basis of a price tag, and I like this one. He it says, it's how much money you're going to make if you make it. Obviously, we're working on programs and projects where there's a budget. What is the business case behind? I don't know if any of us, if we're working on a team that's developing an application, do you know what the business case is? It sh that information should be available to us if we're looking for it. The bank's expecting to make $100 million from this application. Somebody has planned it. Somebody sold the business case to up, up the chain. But do we know, and it maybe comes back to what's that purpose, why are we doing the thing we're doing? Improve constantly and forever the system of production and service, amplifying feedback loops. Feedback loops. Continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous testing. It's not new, but even today, a lot of us are not in an organization where that's being practiced. Institute training on the job. So he talks a lot about a learning organization. I've worked for some companies where all the marketing, whether it's at the urinals in the men's toilet or on the walls as you walk through the place, they talk about and it's HR and marketing people. We're a learning organization. But in reality, it's not. Because they think because they have some courses online or they've given you a LinkedIn learning or a Udemy license, we are a learning organization. But what does this speak to? It speaks to the fact that as we all make mistakes, we learn from it. And we have an environment where we can speak honestly, no matter what your level is in the team. Again, the reality of that, I have very rarely experienced in my life. 
So a true learning organization is not a LinkedIn learning organization. It's where you can be honest about the mistakes you've made, or you can honestly address the mistakes someone else has made in the spirit of helping each other. So it's not criticism and the like like that. Again, it's difficult to find this happening practically. practically. Help people and machines and gadgets to do a better job. What do we speak about a lot today? Cobotics, robots, working with robots, artificial intelligence. This is going to take over our lives. This is going to help us do things better. Hopefully, what artificial intelligence will do in the world of testing is to take over a lot of the repetitive reporting stuff we're doing so we can actually focus on some other things. So I don't think it's going to take over our lives. But we'll be able to be able to harness that technology to focus on the right things so that the repetitive boring things can be done by RPA or by AI and things like that. Drive out fear so that everyone may work efficiently for a company, blameless post-mortems. Have any of you experienced a blameless post-mortem? Do you know what a post-mortem is? Or it, so it, it, it's essentially when we look back at the last few sprints or when we look back at the project, a post-mortem is... Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's, you know, if somebody's died, and they have a post-mortem, you cut them open to make sure what's the, so what's the reason why this happened? So that's a post-mortem. As a team, we all get together, we obviously talk about, uh, just kind of a retrospective, if you would, talk about what went right and what went wrong. But what went right is often an ego conversation. Because there are people that all want to take the glory for things that you most likely did right. And the, the, what went wrong is often the fingerprinting. Uh, fingerprinting, <laughs> finger pointing. They say the coat of arms of many organizations is this. You know, it's not me, it's somebody else. But imagine, so if you seriously screwed up, you know you made a mistake, would you rather swipe it under the rug, like my five-year-old does? Or do you have the confidence to, and, but do you have the kind of team and leadership where you can say, honestly, I messed up, because you know there will be respect, they will learn with you, um, you don't have to fear. A lot of people manage teams on fear. 40 years ago, blameless post-mortems. In your own team, is that what you are doing as a manager or a leader? Can, or do you allow people to learn from their mistakes? Now, obviously, after the 55th time of learning from that same mistake, maybe it's time to fire them. But you know what I'm saying. So it's not an open for all, but do people have the confidence to make mistakes? Because if people feel they can't make mistakes, they will not innovate. They will not try things for the first time. They will just stay low enough under the radar not to get fired. Okay. Break down barriers between departments. DevOps speaks about that. High trust cultures or high performing cross functional collaboration. If I had showed you that without the background of Deming, you would think it's a DevOps slide. All right. 40 years old. Almost done with these 14 points. Stop management by slogans. Basically, what that says it's back to my point your managers went to Silicon Valley, they came back, and now it's like zero defects is the thing for 2019. Posters there on the wall or whatever it is. But it actually means nothing for us on the ground. Don't manage your people like that, in my words, sorry. Supervisors must change sheer numbers to quality, make workers feel pride in what they do. Do you manage your people by purely dashboards and spreadsheets? Or are you managed like that? It's a horrible thing. You're not looking at the human and the reason why that human is performing or not. It can't just be pure numbers. You must create a place that is great to work at team that is fun to work with. You can't do it with statistics. And I love this. I'm sure you all love this. Abolishment of the annual um, rating system. We all go through this. Well, it depends on your, your organization and financial year ends and stuff. The so-called bell curve, I'm sure you've been through that. You've got 100 people in your team and we only have $4,000 or euros for bonuses. So no matter how we slice this, we can only use that $4,000. So now you've got some top performance, to performers, but because of the sheer number of people that you're rating, you have to cut them down. And it's not even just about bonuses. Yes, obviously we want to earn bonuses, but it's more about the pride of um, being recognized, of receiving a promotion and things like that. But we are treating people from, and we've learned this even in the, in the industrial age, as robots, as beings that produce things. But there's a human being behind that. So. I've been in organizations where they've totally revamped this merit system. Change management, new branding, exciting. But I've never been in an organization that, that where that new merit system didn't essentially just come back to the old one. Still the same thing. We call it different things. How much time do I have left? Because I do have a 
a lot of slides left. Okay, so it's a little bit of time, okay. We spoke about um, uh, learning organization, so this is what he recommends. Education, improvement. I love this. Transformation is everybody's job. We can just well say quality is everyone's job. We know that. In a DevOps squad, that is what we should be saying. And I think a lot of us are saying it. But maybe to this point, I don't know if you've experienced this. In the past, and to some extent today, our colleagues in our organizations and our colleagues in development and, and in other roles we typically see testers as what I would call second-hand citizens. Okay? I don't know why, because they think testing is easy. You just, you know, it's kind of if you're on the bench, for instance, and even if you've got no testing experience, I mean, you just use a testing tool and you click a few buttons and then it's automated. And the reason they believe it, it's that's often how the tool vendors are selling it, you know. Um, I worked for a one of, well, you saw the logo, a very large global consultancy. Um, and their view of testing was that you prime, we test our own projects and anyone can test. So anyone who's on the bench, we can roll off onto a new program. I sold a, a quite a big um, cards and payments testing deal to a bank. But I was forced to use everyone on the bench. And that's a very specific domain experience that you need from a payments point of view to test those systems, like with many other main systems. Obviously the project wasn't a success, but the view of that organization was that testing is kind of, you know, if you really couldn't make it in as a developer, you can become a tester. The world is changing, and I've seen this practically in my own market, where if you do it right, and if it's the right kind of project, you can entice hardcore developers to become quality engineers. We've had a few evenings through a vendor who facilitated it when I was at the bank. They would shortlist some hardcore developers, and I'm talking ponytails, ripped jeans, you know, those kind of people that you almost never want to put in front of clients. And um, what we would do, rather than put our job ad on LinkedIn, and it's just a theoretical exercise, we'd have beers and wine, about 20 of them, and we would actually tell them what we're busy with. We'd share our vision. Um, and we got them excited. And we had quite a high ratio of these developers signing up for a quality engineering and a testing role. So it's possible. The question then is, will the hardcore developers who become QA people take our jobs from us? Because we haven't learned to develop and to code and things like that. All right, but quality transformation is everyone's job. I'm going to skip through some of these, and as I said, the slides will be available in the next week or so, I assume. Tiachi Ono, who, um, and you can see they're kind of the one follow on the others, father of Toyota production system. Obviously, if you're going to read about improvement and, and lean and things like that, it's pretty much all about Toyota. Part of that Deming's influence in the Japanese manufacturing world. Why Toyota became such a successful organization. It talks about the seven wastes, and you can just scan through it, but I'm going to just quickly move on. Leah Goldratt, I don't know if, how many of you have read The Goal. You know about that book? I'll show you the picture just now. It's actually a novel where he talks about uh, a lot of the principles we're talking about today, it is a great book. He's well known for the theory of constraints. And then there's always a bit of a debate, is it theory of constraints or lean, which one is the best kind of system to work with? But he really made a massive impact on the world of manufacturing. He's actually a physicist, but he wrote this novel about somebody working with a production environment, and I'm not talking software, like a factory floor, where they had problems, where they had to identify waste, they had to identify bottlenecks, I mean, it's things we know but that proper engineering practice on a factory floor was to a large extent um, influenced by him. And later on in what we do, which I'll get to now. Fowler then wrote the so-called Agile Manifesto. We know all these things. Again, I don't know how many of us actually live this every day. Individuals over processes, working software over comprehensive documentation, collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. We know these principles. Do you see how the one steps on the shoulders of the next one? Sorry, I keep on pressing the wrong button, yeah. Marion Tom Poppendick, Lean Software Development. I'm sure you, please, have you read that book? It's been around for a while. But they also build on the shoulders of these giants. So they have basically been taking, as you see the bullet points there, the principles from manufacturing and the engineering point of view and applied it to software development. So a lot of what we know is possible. 
how the team integrity see the whole and the, the bigger context. It's the same kind of principles that keep on repeating themselves. Eric Ries, who wrote that book, The Lean Startup, again, a must-read book. All right? He's the person who made the term minimal viable product um, famous, really. A lot of us work with MVPs. I don't know if you always know, if we know what it means. But the principles behind it, he really established with his co-author. Um, so this is a must-read book as well. And you, Simon Sinek, if you're on YouTube, you must have seen him. We must have seen him being advertised kind of on the sidebar. All right, his talk, Start With Why, which is also the title of his book, is the, I think it was the most viewed talk either on YouTube or on TED. A 15-minute talk. It is an amazing, amazing book and an amazing talk. And essentially, have any of you seen the talk or know about him? Okay, so for those of you who don't know about him, maybe of everything I've done today, this is the one person you go and check up. This is a current picture. He's a fairly young guy, I reckon. He must be in his mid-40s, fairly young. <laughs> um, but essentially what he says is we, we don't always or very rarely focus on why we're doing something. We focus on the what and the how. If you look at how we plan and how we work with clients and things like that. But this talks about purpose. Now, remember some of the previous slide and principles. It talks a lot about that. And you can't work from the outside in, essentially. You have to start from the inside. What is the purpose? Why are we doing this thing? And then you work through the what and the how. So Simon Sinek is really somebody to, um, to look at on, online. He talks a lot about millennials. Some of us here are so-called millennials, but a lot of us work with teams or manage teams who are the so-called Millennials, the entitled generation. We want everything right now and for as cheap as possible. So he does some great talks about them and how to manage those people, how to get the best out of them. A lot of principles. I love these. It's just his principles for life. Um, it's, it's something when you look at it, you go, oh, I wish I knew this guy. So on, and then obviously Patrick Dubois, who coined the fr phrase DevOps um, with some other authors, first about 2009 when we first heard about the word DevOps and what it means, so also somebody worth following. And now, last few slides, I want to talk about testing and DevOps. And now I put this word cloud there for a reason. So let's look at some of those things. Docker. Because you hear these words being thrown around. Let's see other words that might be appear. So tools and code, that's all stuff we know. There's DevOps, model processing, cloud, human meters, so how do you pronounce that word? You guys must know. This one? No one? What I'm trying to show you is if you speak to people who work in DevOps, half the time I actually, especially in the beginning, I didn't have a clue what they were speaking about. Because they throw around a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of new terms that I've never heard of before. And, and my colleagues and I, this is what I've experienced and maybe you as well. As you embrace this world of DevOps, as you start working in a squad, or whichever way you do it in your organization, one of the biggest challenges I had was that half the time I didn't know what they were talking about. Because there were a lot of new terminology. And you know, often with these very, very small terms, if you actually understand what the term means, and you think, could they not just have used a simpler word because it's actually not such a complex concept, they just use a very smart word for it. But as quality engineers and as testers, and as we start embracing DevOps, and as we work for organizations where we work in a DevOps way, there's a lot of new terms that's going to come your way. And it goes back to constant learning. I make little notes on my phone or on a piece of paper whenever, and I sometimes feel I'm not listening in a meeting, because there are meetings where I don't listen. I literally just write down the stuff I don't know, which is like a page or two. And then I just go and Google it. I try and learn. The best way for me to learn is to try and explain it back to someone else especially someone maybe at home who's not technical or in software, if they can get it, then you understand what it's about. Okay. So try and explain it. So as I said, I tried to do this DevOps with my five-year-old son. I think he kind of got it in a way. All right. The point I'm making here is just it's, a, it's for a lot of us a whole new world. There's a lot of things that always stay the same. Like I alluded to earlier, you might now work in a DevOps squad, but the squad still sees testing as why do we really need it, and it's somebody who we might not respect, and it happens at the end. They always work there on the, on the end of the SDLC while they're now bothering us here in the squad. And a lot of testers have never learned to have a voice because a lot of us operate best in our little corner at the end. But now you have to speak to architecture, to business. You need to be able to speak about quality, not just a tool or a framework. 
So that's kind of business acumen, that ability to speak and to understand the end purpose of what we're doing is in my experience where I found most testers really struggle because nothing we have done for years have ever prepared us for that new world. And that's where testers often fail. Or that's where a lot of testers fear to go because you're going to be expected to know other things, to speak in a different way than you've spoken before. The challenge is, can, especially if you are a very technical person, can you explain your tools and frameworks and the reasons why you test and all those kind of things to a business person who might not be a technologist at all? Because it's easy to speak to others who are testers or technical because we speak our little language. But if testing is a means to an end, that end is working software and it's working securely and it's working fast enough, all those things we know. Is can you take all that technical knowledge and experience and translate it to a business conversation? Where it's about cost, it's about return on investment, it's about market penetration and things like that. In my own experience, a lot of people who are very smart and good testers struggle with that. It might be your experience as well. So you have to start reading some other books than just testing stuff or technical stuff. You might read books like How Do I Conduct a Meeting? How Do I Speak in a Meeting? Body Language, for instance. How do you speak truth to power? So how do you disagree with somebody in business, for instance, who might be, have a very overbearing personality? Those are skills that we've most likely never had the opportunity to learn. So you have to increase your technical skills, obviously. But alongside that, you have to increase your way of working in a way that you might have never worked before. All right, so we've seen this earlier from Dan Ashby. A few last principles. We're almost at the end now. Like I've said earlier, and I think it's experience of most likely everyone in this room, DevOps or any kind of change to that magnitude is more often than not pushed from the top down without real understanding what's happening on the ground. So now suddenly you must work in the squad and in guilds and they've got all these names and they take the Spotify model like they would with anyone in Silicon Valley, and they want to take that model 100% and put it on your 110-year-old bank. Okay, and it's a mess because it's so um, federated. It's people working against each other. It often fails. All right. Culture shift. We all know about it. Like I said earlier, DevOps is primarily not a testing or a technical conversation. Yes, the way, like I've said, the way we work, the tools we use, everything is changing. But it's about are we working together? about having different business skills than just testing technical kind of skills. It's always culture before technology. How do we change the culture in an organization? That's a difficult thing. It has, talks a lot about change management. It, it talks about how we're working together. And it's something that you as an individual or an individual team most likely cannot influence. How do you change the whole culture of your whole organization? Unless you change management or when it comes from the top down, you will most likely not change the culture. All right. I'm sure you've experienced that too. We no longer work at the end of the cycle. New skills, like I've already mentioned. Just briefly toward the end, and I'm going to actually, I wanted to read through these slides, but I'm going to touch on some of them. If you don't know about this website, QA Financial, make a note. They really are producing some amazing articles. So a lot of it is um, banking and fintech related. A lot of it is business related as it applies to software testing, but it is really a great website, great white papers and amazing videos they produce based on their own um, kind of um, events. Test automation helps DevOps adoption, but teams still struggling with bugs at release, says survey. What are they talking about? <laughs> we most likely all live this world one way or another. Okay, I just want to leave it there quickly for those who want to take pictures. And then I've got a lot, so I've, I learned once, you should never have more than 14 words on the slide. So I've broken my rule here. All right, but you can quickly scan it. I wanted to read it, but I think I'm going to just quickly um, say some of the things, but have a look there or take pictures if you want to. So it actually results in additional manual processes. Isn't that interesting? If you don't apply DevOps correctly, if you don't implement it correctly, if you actually we should have shifted left and there should have been more automation. It could result in a lot more manual work, manual testing. 62 of respondents citing these as the reasons they resort to manual testing. Lack of clarity around the metrics of success. 93% of respondents citing customer satisfaction. But it's such a wide, what does it mean? Like no one ever complains that customer satisfaction 
clients always walk into the bank branch with a smile. So what is customer satisfaction? I think for me personally, it's it just the stuff works. I don't actually care how fuzzy I feel about the mobile app. I just want it to work, work quickly. All right. But CICD, so this is encouraging at least. 57% of those surveyed encourage uh, um, account a fewer bugs, so that's good. This is also, now remember, back to the 40-year-old principles, feedback loops, learning quickly. That's essentially what the CICD pipeline is about. Receiving customer feedback faster, microservices. Find it easy to test, so this is a positive one. Oh, I love this. Adoption of DevOps is by itself not a guarantee of quality. That's so true. Like, remember, what is it, about 10, 15 years ago when test automation became a bigger thing, where the tool vendors were really pushing hard for it? They sold it as a silver bullet, essentially. I don't know if you can remember that. If you sp spend $5 million on the tool, you will automate everything. And that's essentially what they sold us. And they invoiced us, and we paid them, and they left. <coughs> and for many years, many organizations did not do proper automation. The same could happen here yeah, again. Bosses come back from Silicon Valley, Valley, we have to do DevOps. Does it really make our lives easier? Okay, now I come to the books, and then we're almost done. I can see it's kind of the end of the day. I think I almost need to ask you all to stand up, run around a little bit, and go sit it down, get some fresh air, but we're almost there. So that's the Goldratt book. This cover you most likely have seen a million times walking through a bookstore. But I, it's written in the form of a novel, um, and it's really a great book to read. And he really establishes so many of the principles. Um, essentially, the main character is, the, the, um, is a factory uh, um, manager, factory floor production manager, and the issues he's dealing with. You know, he, t he touches a lot on constraints and bottlenecks and things like that. It was followed by an audio book called Beyond the Goal, which is also great listening to. I find audiobooks easier because I can listen to it in the car. Yeah, but it's not the audiobook of that book. It's actually a conversation about that book. But before you read any of the other books I'm going to show you, I really encourage you to read this book first. I've listened to the audiobook again recently. It's, again, it's because it's fiction or it's written as a novel. I just find it a bit easier than sitting every night. You know, I don't know if you can read after a day of working. I struggle. My brain is finished. So the car is easier in any case. So Goldratt is really the start of your self-education process. The Phoenix Project, I really hope many of you know about. All right. The Phoenix Project, if you listen to, and they've done the same. They also have a Beyond the Phoenix Project, like we just had with a Beyond the Goal. And this one is great. In fact, this one is, takes about two hours to listen to. They touch on a lot of the things um, that I've spoken about today. In fact, a lot of the, especially the names and what they've contributed, I've got, I got from from this audio um, book, and it, I kind of made notes and then read more about all these people started reading their books. Um, Gene Kim is, if you Google DevOps, or if you look at anything on YouTube, you'll most likely find him. All right. They've, they've, this is also a novel, and they say we clearly kind of stole or, or very confidently copied what Goldrod did in his book, The Goal. Uh, it's also, but this is a novel not about a factory floor, but about an actual software development team and what goes wrong. Have any of you read that book yet, Phoenix Project? It's kind of the go-to book the last few years when you talk about DevOps. People always talk about that. Jim Kim and team also, and then Patrick DeBoer who, who coined DevOps, the phrase, they, that DevOps handbook's very good. Now, can you see that I'm not asking you, we'll get to that now, but when, I'm not asking you to read testing books. I'm, I'm encouraging you to read books about the principles behind manufacturing, principles of lean and bottlenecks and wastage, because that applies to what we do, even though we work in QA and testing. Katrina Cloakey, I'm sure, and I hope many of you know about her. She works for the Bank of New Zealand down in Wellington. Uh, a lovely person to contact on LinkedIn or on Twitter. She almost always responds. She published this book on LeanPub, but it's a practical book for test practitioners who now is thrusted into this world of DevOps. Any of you maybe have read that book? But start with Goldratt. Start at the goal. Do you read, guys? What do you read? <laughs> No. Okay, so, so Katrina Cloakey's book, and then there are actually, this is one of the books I read that I actually found quite interesting on continuous testing, but there are some really good books that will then pull in the CI, CD pipeline and the new technology around it. 
But again, none of this will truly make sense if you don't start with the goal and then the, the Phoenix project because the principles behind quicker feedback and working together in smaller teams and shorter iterations and all those things is really based on these giants that we stand on. And you will better be able to apply the principles in your own life if you understand where it comes from. And now I'm back to the last slide again. Now it is truly the last slide again. Let me quickly go through it and then we're done. Most of us still work here or here. A lot of manual testing. It takes a long time. We do a lot of manual testing. Often because we're not upskilling ourselves, that's all we know. But for many of us, it's because of the kind of em environment we work in. Some of you might be technical automation test engineers, who, and, but still most of what you do is still manual testing because of the way the project is run or the way the organization works. But because of how the world is changing, we can't stay here anymore. It's changing too quick. A lot of us work in agile kind of teams where we've introduced some sort of agility but not really agile. All right? DevOps should help us jump to continuous testing, continuous integration. I'm glad when I asked how many of you work within this, there was quite a few hands. To a large extent, we're still figuring this out. So are we taking the bad habits from here and here? And we've just put it in here. That's always the question. Are we just using the buzzwords? But is there, is there really proper feedback loops? That's a good question on, 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 on the CICD pipeline, whether we automate more or whether we use Docker or all these other kind of things, is the principles that we learned now from Deming onwards. Do we practice it yet? And then there has been some talks today. And um, Jeremiah's, let me do some marketing for you quickly. Do you want to stand? He's speaking after me. Jeremiah Rischler from Germany. Um, he is of, because I like AI stuff, so I've done some research. Joel also spoke about AI earlier, so you should get that talk. But test practitioners working practically in AI, Jeremy is one of the top guys in the world. I can honestly say that. Not because I want anything. <laughs> but So I encourage you to stay for the next talk. Because we're still grappling with this stuff here. But the world is already here. But the complexity is incredible. Where we have to move very quickly. So how do we take AI and test better? Or how do we test AI systems? Will AI totally take over our worlds? Will we lose all our jobs? And so forth. But can you see how far we are away from where we should be? And not, remember, AI is not a thing of the future. We all know it. We all use the AI today. How many of you used AI today? We've all, who have a mobile phone, have used artificial intelligence today. It's still in its infancy. But what do you do if you get a job tomorrow to test an AI system or to go look for an AI tool set that can, through machine learning, do testing? We did a POC at the bank where I worked with before, and then I'm going to end off. Um, it was through Watson, so you can imagine which, which was the consulting firm, if you should put two and two together. But look at this business case. We had a big program where we had 100,000 test cases. Okay? Through machine learning, we brought it down to 10,000. But we increased our coverage with 90%. Okay. Now that cannot always happen everywhere. So our own maturity, obviously data is a massive problem for a lot of us. Data is all over the show. And how can a machine learn if we don't feed it with data? But the experts will talk more about that. But imagine, so the question is, do we now need to fire the testers? No. But imagine the great exciting things they can now focus on rather than all the reporting and the documentation and the manual testing and things like that. It will take some time before we really move there practically because of how some organizations just mature slower. But DevOps is just scratching the surface. Machine learning and AI is really what's going to impact our world. It's already impacting our world. But how do we become the testers? That I've already seen on LinkedIn jobs being advertised. Artificial intelligence test engineer. Will you apply for that job? Will you be able to? We don't even know what that is. Because I don't even know if I can apply for a DevOps test engineer yet. You know, so never mind that. And that really is the end. Thank you for your patience. I hope you learned something. The l last thing you take away is that last slide. But the very, very last thing is read Gold Goldrad's book first before you do anything else. And for that matter, just read some books, please, people. Any anyway, guys, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Maybe someone wants to ask some questions. Any questions, guys? I think we still have a bit of time, do we? Yeah, we still have 10 minutes. Okay. 
And we have a free T-shirt for the best question. Remember? We've got about 20 minutes, so if there really are no questions, then we don't have to. Or not even a question. Who, who would want to maybe add to what I've said or even disagree? I'm also okay with that. Maybe a comment on you've been thrown into this DevOps squad as a test and what have you experienced? Have you practically experienced what I talked about or has it been a, an easier transition for you? Joel, I think you should answer this question. <laughs> but let me bring you the microphone. I'm going to now pick on people here. But yeah, yeah, hang on. I mean, this, from the work you've done, is this practically what you think testers experience? Is it easier for others maybe? Well, you know, looking to, to, the, to the history, and um, this was always driven by managers, right? And I think that the problem is still the same today. But the, the distance between what the managers see or want, you, you describe that. They, they go to somewhere and then they say, oh, oh now we go agile. Or now we go uh, um, continuous testing, continuous automation, uh, or we go AI. There is this broken link between uh, what managers want or what they think they want with actually what is happening in the field. And it's quite common. It happens to me. You go to some organization and you go and you talk with the managers. How do you work? And they describe the process. And then you really talk with the ones that are doing it. And then you realize it's, it's like, are we talking about a different company, a different organization? Because it's completely different. So when we are talking about all these concepts, uh, of course, they make sense. But it's important that we are able to bring the ones that are taking the decision, the decision makers, and the practitioners, the ones that are actually doing it. Without this link, I don't think anything will make any sense. And we will have the same problems, the same discussions some years from now, just with another name. Exactly. Yeah. I think and, and for those of us who are leaders or managers, it's an important principle. Is do we really understand what our people are doing day to day in the trenches? Yes, you've got other responsibilities. You can't spend your whole day in the project. But we should have some understanding. Again, back to the factory floor, one of the principles, and there's a smarter name for it that I can't remember now, but it's talk, it talks about constantly walking around. So sometimes, rather than sending an email, walk to that team, chat to them for five minutes. Because you're going to make decisions that's going to impact their lives. But we might not have a real clue about what is really affecting their lives. But sometimes there are some fundamentally small, seemingly small things like the way they are being treated by the project manager, as an example, or by the product owner, who treats them like crap. How do you, you can't fix that with an email. You can't fix that with DevOps in it by itself. Sometimes you need to walk up to somebody and have a very honest talk about it, the respect they need to uh, talk to people with, as an example. But we have to understand what is impacting our people. Any other comments? Anyone? Hello, my name is Razvan. Uh, I, I was uh, in a previous conference and uh, they talk about the role of a tester manager in DevOps, somehow in Agile. And uh, coming here now and after this speech will be another speech about when we will be fired by the artificial intelligence. <laughs> so coming from Agile uh, with the test manager and going to being fired by artificial intelligence is somehow confusing. Uh, maybe the true it's it's in the middle uh, somewhere. It's like I don't know. You are going to the doctor. You are have pain at the back, and he's telling you make sports, more sports, or go swimming. But everyone, my mother, tell me go swimming. But it's 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 a particular case. Maybe my my pain. So actually I will say DevOps somehow it's only generally, maybe in particular cases uh, it cannot be applied. That I want to say. For example, Romania has uh, uh, the internet speed, one of the biggest uh, in Europe. That doesn't mean it's better like in Germany, which has the slowest, one of the slowest. So, so maybe growing so fast, we lose somehow the particular 
I don't know. Quite confusing. This, this is the idea. What I would say is, and I hope this complements what you're saying. I, I will never, or no one who speaks here, or even if you speak to people, you will never 100% understand the, the world that that person is living in. So if, even if you take just the books that I showed you and you learn from that, but if, if you can take some of the principles that you hear from some of the talks at this conference and apply it to your life, then I think you benefited from the conference. You know? So I don't think DevOps is the answer to everything. And it, it might be that DevOps or all the principles of DevOps, or for that matter, Agile, might not always work depending on where you are. And it's most likely how the organization is run that, that is the, the fault rather than skills or your ambition to do it or anything like that. So take the things that will work. But I also think, you know, this whole change to DevOps and to AI and all those things, guys, it's baby steps. Get the first things right. Figure out what the first things are. We can't just one day jump off a cliff and we know AI ready or we work perfectly in squads. There's maybe some very fundamental little things wrong in the culture or in your own team that you can change, that can, for instance, help people enjoy working together, trusting each other, feeling a sense of achievement. If you can get those things right, then DevOps will help. But if you don't have those kind of things, you can call the thing whatever you want to. It's, it's not going to work. We don't trust each other. We don't communicate. It's like saving a marriage. I tried that. It didn't work for me. But <laughs> you, can call it, you can call the kind of counseling or the camp you're going for, like marriage renewal 2019 or whatever. But you can call the thing what you want. But if you don't forgive each other, if you don't learn to communicate, those kind of things, you won't save the man. Maybe one more question? Are we done? Oh, your hand was up. Let me bring you the mic. Uh, thanks for your speech. Uh, according to Lean in DevOps, uh, there should not be stacks. If there are some too many tasks in some sphere for developers, for example, or for build managers, then uh, all other members can, uh, should be able to move to the sphere and help these people. Uh, how people react to that fact that in addition to their main activity like developing or building, uh, they have to learn to do something else because this is like comfort zone and people don't like to leave it. Mm. That's a good comment. Did everyone get that? Those people who are talking, did you get it? I just I could have been a school teacher. <laughs> okay. Comfort zone, those kind of things. But I mean, there's some relevant comments there. Anyone want to comment on what she said? Here we go. Um, I switched over from um, an agile team. I switched to uh, workplaces. I went to a team that fully implements DevOps, uh, and I started as a continuous tester. And uh, taking over other people's roles was definitely a big struggle that I experienced. And uh, basically what I want to say is, for the first three months after the DevOps transformation, you're going to feel incredibly stupid. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to be prepared for that. That you're going to have to ask questions that are trivial to other people. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you're stupid for it because you're going to receive also quite uh, trivial questions about testing as well. So basically, it's a very, very big knowledge exchange for the first three months to three to six months, basically. Yeah. That's absolutely yeah. true. I think because suddenly you're thrown into this world, and then it's not, and I think your point's relevant, it's not just suddenly the testers must figure out how to do this. But everyone in the DevOps world, almost no one has really properly worked together before on a daily basis. So, and, and how do you answer those trivial testing questions with a lot of patience? It's a very good point, because you can also then ask the developers trivial questions, you know. So it comes back to that learning culture, and where it's okay to make mistakes and okay to ask stupid questions. All right. I want to just ask you one more thing. Is please, can I have many smiley faces on the door as you walk out? Okay. Um, and then remember Jeremy's talk next. I want to encourage you to be here for that. But um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. 
Happy to chat to anyone who's a smoker after this. And um, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity again.